Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's good to have you here this morning. Let's pray before we begin our study. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together to sit under the Word of God. And Lord, we just thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And we welcome you, Holy Spirit, in our, in our place this morning. And we welcome you in our teaching and our, and our worship service and our preaching of the Word, Lord. And we, Father God, we just pray that something that was, will be said today, Lord, will speak to the hearts of those who are listening. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us in this hour. Not just our physical ears, but open our spiritual ears to hear as well, Father. In his precious name, I do pray. Amen and amen. Uh, if you will turn with me in your book, the Bibles, to the book of uh, Hebrews, where, uh, chapter 4, and I just got into verse 5 uh, last Sunday. I just actually just read the verse, but I didn't really get into it for time's sake. I ran out. But anyway, verse 5 says here, and it's actually, this verse 5 is actually a continuation from verse 4. So if we go back to verse 4, it says, For he, speaking of God, spoke in a certain place of a seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And, and, verse 5, and in this place again, speaking of Psalm 95, verses 7 through 11, it's this continuation of the book, the book of Psalm, what Paul's referring to, if they shall enter into my rest. That word big, that word if is a big word, isn't it? So that the, the choice is up to you. You make the decision whether you want to enter into the rest of God. And you know, really, if you think about it, that one of my favorite passages in the Bible, Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, and we all know this, and we've heard it a number of times, but it really speaks of what we're talking about today. And it's actually, it's actually the whole book of Hebrews, to be honest with you. And it says, Come unto, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Oh, man. <laughs> He'll, he'll give rest to our souls, our thirsty souls. Amen. Take my yoke. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of what he did for you on the cross. That's what the book of Romans 6, 3 through 5 tells us to do. Learn of me. Learn of what, what he did, who he was and what he did. What he did for your victory, for your salvation. Amen. For I am meek and lowly in heart. That's the only thing Jesus really said of himself. I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. Oh, my goodness. My go rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You know, it's the only thing Jesus requires of us is to have faith in, in him. We can't do anything. We, we can't handle that yoke. But he gives us his yoke. We can handle that because he handles it for us. We just, you know, all he wants is our faith in him. That's it. He just wants us to believe. You can't, out, you can't, you can't work for God and, and, and because God's not looking at your works. He's looking at your faith. Where do you believe? Do you believe? What do you, so his, all he asks of us is his faith in him and his atoning work for us. He says here, and in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. Well, the question is, how do we enter into the rest of God? How do we do that? There are conditions that need to be met. But the first thing is, you, the only way you can get in is by being born again. You've got to be born again. You've got to be saved. You've got to know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Amen. That's the only way you enter. That's how you get in. But there's ways you have to stay in. You have to stay in that. It's not just a one-time thing. You're justified, but you also have to stand, which speaks of sanctification, isn't it? The, the same God that saved you is the same God that keeps you saved, and you will be saved. Amen. Praise God. So we continue to see the Apostle Paul always anchored, his, always anchored what he says in the New Testament back to the Old Testament. Just like I said last week, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Whereas the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Amen. So praise God. The idea is we can't understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. You've got to read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. The old is a foundation for the new. 
The old is the foundation for the new. So not having a proper understanding of the Old Testament at least is one of the reasons why people fall into false doctrine. You've got, you got to have an understanding of the Old Testament. You just can't take just part of the Bible. You've got to take the whole Bible. You just can't cherry pick scriptures you like. You've got to take all of it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> so many foolish concepts are brought forth which in fact holds no scriptural validity. validity. People fall, that's why people fall into this false doctrine. Amen. While many things in the Old Testament have been fulfilled and are not meant to be repeated, still the symbolism of these passages portray and help explain the reality that is in the New Testament. Do you understand what I'm saying? The symbolism of the Old Testament speaks of the reality of the New Testament. As he says here, and continue with verse 5, if they shall enter into my rest. That word F stands, like I said, or it stands out pretty big. So, uh, and there are conditions that must be met to enter in this rest provided by God. Notice God says, my rest. It's his rest. Salvation in its entirety is all of God and not of man. It's all of God. He provided it for us and not of much. We just simply partake of it as a free gift. Amen. And this is where the battleground really begins right here. This is where the battle, this is what we're seeing today in the modern church. Man has ever attempted to have his, attempt his own way, his own means, his own way of salvation. Where man's being corrupted, sinful and depraved can provide no salvation whatsoever. Your church cannot provide your salvation for you. Your, your association with the body of Christ provides no... You, you're associated with, a, with the body of Christ because you are saved. Amen. So man can't even save himself, much less others. <laughs> so these personal efforts of salvation fall into many ways and means. I heard this said... I read this the other day. The world attempts to manufacture another God where the church attempts to manufacture another sacrifice. Isn't that something? Think about that. The world attempts to manufacture another God where the church attempts to manufacture another sacrifice. What do I mean by that? I mean that what does the church do? What do they do other than Christ? What do they believe in other than Christ? They believe in all the other stuff. They think their association with the church attendance. They, what doing good works. That's what they're basing their faith on, stuff like that. I'm going to tell you something, my friends. We cannot base our faith on anything else but what he did for us. You're, we don't merit nothing with God. We don't earn anything with God. It's a free gift. The church is the greatest means of all that it refers to man. But Satan does his finest work in the church. He does his finest work. He does. He, the church is of God. However, man has ever attempted to make it more than it actually is. We can look at the Catholic church. <laughs> It constitutes, they think the church is the means of salvation. They do. The church said, that Catholic church believes the Bible is what they say it is. They take their traditions above the Word of God. And so they magnify their Word above the Word of God's Word Himself. So they make the Word of God subservient to what they're saying. In other words, they're exalting man above the Word of God. Am I right? Were well, you going to say something, Pastor? glad you're saying this because most churches today refuse to say what you just said that the catholic religion is a theological cult it is and that yeah. they are no different than any other cult mm -hmm. they put man's words above the truth of god's word yes they indeed. have some things right we give them credit for that mm -hmm. but so do many cults exactly that, but you can't be saved and remain in a catholic religion you can't you, you know? can't you you You'll, uh, in fact, if you don't get out of the Catholic Church, you'll succumb to that false doctrine. You will eventually succumb to it. And sad to say, what I just told you about the Catholic Church, many of the Protestant churches are falling by the same, they're, they're joining it with them. We've seen that, now, haven't we? A lot of that going by. And so they many teach and believe that salvation, association with a particular church, affords salvation. You know, you people say, well, I'm, you know, I've heard people say, well, I go to, you ask them if you're saved, no, oh, I go to church, such and such a church. You know, they think they're saved by joining that church, being part of it. You can't, you're not saved by being a part of a church. You're saved by being in the body of Christ. Amen. Being part of a church doesn't make you less or, 
Some people think, well, I'm belonging to this church makes me more of a Christian than that one of the people out there. You know, we can't do that. Amen. So going back to God's statement, he says in verse 4, verse, chapter 4, verse 5, he says, My rest is all of God and it's meant for man to receive and never man to originate. Man can never originate that. It's all of man. It's not of, excuse me, it's not of man, but rather for man. It's for us, not of us. It's for us. Amen. And if we get those two things confused, we can lose our soul. Amen. So how do we come to the question, how does one enter into God's rest? Jesus said in John 14, verse 6, we know this scripture by, I'm sure every one of us know it by heart. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I, how is he the way? The first question we need to ask, well, how is he, how is he the way? Yeah. How, he, how is he the way? Okay. Is he a way because he is the healer? Is he the way because he is a great miracle worker? Is he that way because he's a prophet? Is he that way because he's a great teacher? All those things that he was of that, but that didn't save man. It's only by the... On the cross, what he did on Calvary, on the hill of Golgotha. That's, 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 where the, that's what saves men right there. He's the way. He's the only way. All those other ways, are, that they, don't, they didn't save anybody. So it's because of what Christ did at the cross and his resurrection. All on our behalf. He died. When he died, we died. with. When he was buried, we, buried with, we were buried with him. Our, sin, our sins were buried in that tomb. And when he was raised from the dead, we were raised with him unto the newness of life. Praise God. That's Romans 6, 3 through 5. I just told you. Amen. So why, it's why, it's so why it's so important for us to understand that when we speak of faith in Christ, we're speaking of what he did on our behalf. He, that's, that's what it means by he is the way. He's also, next, he's the truth. Jesus doesn't have truth. He is truth. <laughs> Whew, man. I'm going to tell you something, my friends. I, I get excited when I start studying this book of Hebrews. I, I, I've really enjoyed it. I've learned some things out of it myself. Truth is not a philosophy. It's a person. It's Jesus. It's him. It's all about Jesus. Amen. So it's, it's you know, <laughs> he is truth as, in regards to what he's done, which is the cross. Amen. Nothing needs to be added to what he's done. And that's something what a lot of men, uh, churches, modern churches do. They add something to the, uh, the sacrifice. And, and you, when you do that, you just abrogated the finished work of Christ. You can't add nothing to it. It was a perfect sacrifice. A perfect work was done. There's no, what did Jesus say? It is finished. And when he meant finished, it's finished. And nothing needs to be added to it. Amen. His truth is perfect. We can only know God through Christ, and we can only know Christ through what he did on the cross, of, on the hill of Calvary. And the only way you can come to the cross is through the Holy Spirit. Amen. That tells you, that tells me that that's the only way his finished work tells me that's the only way we can, that God will accept us and we can commune with him on a daily basis. Without Calvary, my friends, that's why I make so much about it. Because without it, we don't have a chance. We're doomed. We're doomed, my friends. We're doomed to destruction for all eternity. You know, Pastor, you were talking about that to me on Wednesday night. Why you were so, you were so em uh, emphatic about getting the gospel to people. Because you don't want to see anybody die for it and be eternally lost forever. Remember you shared that with me the other day, Wednesday night? I mean, this ought to be the heart of every true born-again believer. Right. You realize that people are heading to death right now, today. Yeah. There, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands will die today, but it's like, I think it's like one, uh, two every second die. Yeah. Around there, two and a half or whatever. Um, but the fact is, most of them are going to end up in hell. And they're, it's just magic. Put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. Just imagine you, 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 you die. You're in hell forever. You're not getting out of there. Yeah. Now that's a horrible thought. Yeah. And hell is not. God doesn't want anyone to go there. No. But there's no other place for you to go if you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. 
you, there's nothing else God says I can't help you. You're alienated from you, him. In fact, here's the thing. We are already going to hell be, until we get saved. Yeah. See, we're all hell bound. The moment we were conceived, yeah. we're hell bound. Yeah. Man, the problem I, I get is that people don't want to, they don't care that no. people are going to hell. And I think it's because they don't really believe. You hit it right there. But people don't believe. I do, and I and I, it's a horrible thought. Yeah, I think about yeah. it all the time. Oh, I do too, brother. And, I uh, do. We have to preach yeah. the gospel. We have to give people the opportunity to escape that horrible judgment that yeah. every human being is under unless we are saved. You know, Pastor, I, I, every time, I have, I'll share this. Every time I'll, Jody and I'll see something on, something on TV, I'm often like a famous person or, or uh, what happened to that young girl in Georgia a couple of couple months back, Lake and Riley, you know, I'm thinking to myself, was it they didn't know Christ? That was the first thing that comes to my mind. Did they know Jesus? Whew. Can you imagine no amount of fame and fortune could buy their way out of hell? That's what I, that's the first thing I asked you. I said, I wonder if they were saved, you know? Well, it's like, you know, the other day, O.J. Simpson died. And I know a lot of people. Yeah, I've thought about that, that too. That man deserves to go to hell. No, he doesn't. We all deserve to go to hell. Yeah, we do. Well, all of us. Him. All it, of us. I, I get it. Yeah. He probably was guilty, but does it matter? The fact is, even God would forgive a murderer yeah. if they were truly repent. That man had it all. He had money. He had fame. He had, he had look, he, he was in the movies. Yeah. He had it all. He had it all. You know? But life is short. When yeah. Now yeah. he's gone. Yeah. All right. And years from now, he'll be an afterthought. Yeah, it's but, exactly. Uh, you know. Where is he at today? Is he in hell screaming know. out for mercy that he will never get? Yeah. It's or too late. With the Lord? It's There's no late. second chance. There's no purgatory. There's no second chance once you leave. This is it. You know, Pastor, I was reminded of something this morning. When I, when I, early, I, I get up early, and I just spend some time with the Lord. And I was reminded of something that I, was heard, I heard said that was this. If the gospel is not for everybody, then it's not for anyone. If it's not for everybody, then it's not for anybody. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So that tells you, even Adolf Hitler, the gospel is open to him despite he murdered six million Jews during World War II, you know, slaughtered them. He, the gospel was good enough for him. The blood of Christ was to save his soul. And Joseph Stalin, all these, uh, uh, Yasser Arafat and all these other people, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden, you know, even Joe Biden, even uh, uh, Klaus Schwab and that little squirt, and that little, uh, oh, God. How, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah. It's open for him. And he'll discover he ain't some God up in the clouds. And that, to me, it just kind of rubbed me the wrong way. And he said that, some God up in the clouds. He, the, 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 salva the, the, door of, the door of opportunity, salvation is for him too. Anybody. So if it's not for everybody, it's, it's not for anyone. Amen. So praise God. Oh, my goodness. He is the life. He's the truth. He's the way, the truth, and now he's, Jesus is the life. Without Christ, we have no life, my friends. We have no eternal life. I'm telling you, he's the source of all life. He's the source. He's the source of life. The cross is the means by which we receive everything from Christ, but the Christ is the source. The church, the church, they love, they don't mind Christ being the source of every, all the blessings we have, and which we do. But what, what, where the rub comes in is... He's the means. He's the only means, and that's where the rub comes in. People don't like to hear that because that's the only way you can get it. Amen. You have to believe in what he, in the sacrifice and what he did for you. The life comes from him to believing sinners by transforming them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. What happened to you and I when we got accepted Christ as our Savior? We were transformed from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God. Delivered, delivered. And now we've entered into the rest of Christ. Amen. By placing our faith exclusively in what he did for us, what he did for me. Amen. That great sacrifice on my, on my behalf. I'll never forget the day when the day I got saved, a young lady was reading a gospel tract to me. And I and she prayed and I and I prayed that prayer with her. She led me in the center. She led me, and I prayed with her, and I accepted Christ. And I knew for a moment, I didn't, I couldn't explain it, but I knew a change had come on me. You know, I really became a, a, a something. And I can't, you can't explain when you get born again. It's just you, you're, there's a change, your desires change, and although my heart was right, I didn't do everything right. 
I fell into sin, fell into false doctrine and all this other stuff. But God, praise God, he got me out of that stuff. Amen. And Christ has always been the source of life. However, the mere fact that, ma the mere fact that changed man, that fact alone can't change man. But that before this life can be imparted, men were dead in trespasses and sins. The terrible sin question had to be addressed. That ser the terrible sin qu question had to be addressed. And it was addressed on the hill of Calvary. The penalty had to be paid. The penalty. He paid the penalty. If he didn't do it, we couldn't do it. So, we're, so um, that's the only way that life can be imparted to sinful man. There had to be a way in which man could be changed, and how could, the ba how could that be done? Well, we know in, the God, in Genesis chapter 22, God showed Abraham the way which was by death, the death of the Son of God. In Genesis chapter, 20, chapter 22, you'll read uh, the proposed offering up of Isaac on the hill on the Mount Moriah, and uh, God telling Abraham that he would provide. He says in Genesis 22 verse 14, it says, and Abraham called that name of that place Jehovah Jireh. And it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Praise God. So, Jehovah Jireh means what? God will provide. God will provide a redeemer. And, and who was Christ? Who is Christ? Who was Christ? And who is Christ? Even though God showed Abraham the way by which it would be done by death, he did not show him the means by which it would be done. Which that was later shown to Moses. It says in the in book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 6, it says, The Lord sent fiery serpents upon the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. It's fiery serpents. And we see this, in the, so we see the, the consequence of Israel sinning against God. So we have the problem of humanity. Man sins against God, giving Satan the legal right to hold us in captivity and bondage until we accept Christ as our Savior. We're, we're, we were held in captivity and bondage. The answer to this terrible dilemma of man was that God told Moses was a serpent on the pole. In Numbers 21, verse 8, and it's right, and it's the, the, it, Moses writes, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and sit, set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looks upon it, shall live. Praise God. So God shows us the way of salvation through Abraham, but the means by which it would be done be through Moses. Praise God. So, uh, and so <clears throat> that portrays that, that Numbers 21, 8 was specifically tells us that he would be hung upon a tree, that Christ would be hung upon a tree. Verse 6, Hebrews 4, 6, Seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. I'm going to read that again. Seeing therefore it remains, it remains, it remains that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. We've, we've talked about that before. Israel did not believe and they perished. So that tells me seeing therefore it means that the sun must enter in therein. It means that God is still holding the door wide open. It's still open today. Yes, it is. It's still open. And this I love this passage in the book of Revelation. And this actually that's why I came up with the title of our study this morning. The cry of the Holy Spirit. And he says here, in Re the Holy Spirit says in Revelation 22, verse 17, the Apostle John writes, And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who is athirst come, and whosoever will take of, a, of the water of life freely, pr let, him, let him who takes of the water of life freely, praise God. So this, that is the cry of the Holy Spirit, and he's still crying to this very moment right now for people to repent and come to Christ. I'm re let's read that again. And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who is athirst come. See, you have an open invitation. And whosoever, just like I said, whosoever, doesn't matter, whosoever, 
let him will whosoever will will let him take of the water of life freely freely it's a free gift you don't earn nothing you just partake of you receive it praise god let him take of the water of life freely that's a cry to a lost and dying hurting world today and he's still crying for people to come to christ amen and what the holy spirit says to to us what the holy spirit says should also be said by all believers we should cry out to them what's well, our it should be our cry as well amen the door is open to every single individual in the world. He died for all. Therefore, all can be saved if they will only come. Come. As priceless as it is, as wonderful as it is, as glorious as it is, still it is all free. Free. You just come to come. And it's all been purchased. Purchased by what? Yeah, that's right. The shed blood of Christ on the cross. The shed blood. And then they continue on verse 6. And they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Unbelief. They didn't enter in. You know, he says that word preached. He says it three times in this chapter. I, I count I, three times. I looked at it twice in verse 2 and then once in verse 6. So the preaching of the word is so important for us today. Preaching is what saves men, not skits, not discussion groups, not all this other junk that the church proposes today. Go ahead, Pastor. The uh, word for unbelief there is better translated disobedience. Right. And uh, the reason why is it's important is because a lot of people think unbelief. Uh, I believe, so I, that's not me, but how you, what you believe will come out in your actions. Think about that. So, yeah, you're so right. yeah. My, you know, New King James says, since therefore it reigns that some must enter in, and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Yeah. Well, yeah, they, there is unbelief, definitely. Yeah. But there, the unbelief resulted in disobedience, and that's the issue of today's church. We have a lot of people say they believe. But, Ken, you know as well as I do, you believe, you do. If you really believe something, you're going to do it. Yeah, that's, you know, yeah, you, yeah, you, right. Anybody can say they believe. Yeah. But actions speak much louder than words. Yeah. You know, it's like James said, you know, James said, faith without works is dead. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll show you my faith by what I do. That's what James says. I'll show you my faith that's what, by what I do. Amen. But we don't base our faith in our work. We base on what he's done, and our works are just a product, a result of what we believe. Amen. It's not the cause for our faith, but it's the result of our faith. Amen. So, the, and that's God's method of spreading the gospel is preaching the word of God. That's his way of getting it. It's not skits. It's not discussion groups. It's not dramas. You know, we've seen that on uh, Wednesday nights. These churches do all the skits and all this stuff. And that's not, they're not preaching the gospel. They're just having a circus show, you know. It's all it is. And so, uh, and that can never take the place of preaching the gospel. Preaching is God's way. Amen. So what is the message must the preacher proclaim? What message should he proclaim? I'm going to tell you what he should preach. He should preach what Paul, the Apostle Paul preached in 1 Corinthians 1.18. He says, For the preaching of the cross is to them which perish foolishness, but unto us who are saved it is the power of God. Why is it at the power of God? Because the Holy Spirit works within that preached word. The Holy Spirit works. That he's not going to preach. He's not going to anoint. The Holy Spirit's not going to anoint anything outside of Calvary. If any time he does that, he, he, he can't. There's no way. What did Jesus say? He will glorify me. He will glorify what Christ has done. Everything the Holy Spirit does is to glorify the Son of God, what he did. Outside of that, he will not go outside the parameters of the finished work of Christ. It's always within that. Because he seeks to glorify not himself, but to glorify Christ and what he did. Everything Christ, the Holy Spirit does seeks to glorify Christ. Amen. That's the power of God that saves the sinner, sets the captive free, and gives the believer a perpetual victory of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So the cross is the power of God simply because it was there that the total sin debt was paid. Your sin debt was paid. It was paid, my friends. It was paid. I'll tell you, I never get tired of stuff like I love this. People say, oh, here he goes preaching. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to continue doing it. 
and nothing, nobody's going to stop me from doing it. I'm going to continue preaching because I believe it and I act on it. The reason why people say that is because they do not know what the gospel is all about. They don't. They treat salvation as just a little small part when salvation is everything. Yeah. Genesis to Revelation, it's all about Christ coming and suffering, dying, paying the price for the penalty of man's sins. Right. You take away what Christ did, then you don't have a gospel. You don't. All you do is have a, and they made it into a self-help book or a motivational or. For philosophy. Or. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, or, you know, I, I, yeah. uh, nothing more than a bunch of, of yeah. uh, positive quotes they make it into or whatever. It's all about salvation. That's it. Yeah, exactly. Okay? You can't make it into anything else. You can't. If you try to make it into, well, the Lord, yeah, the Lord came and paid the price of my sin, but I really need him for, you know, prosperity or success, then you don't know him. You don't know Christ. You you're know looking him. at you're looking at Jesus as the miracle worker yeah, or the healer. No, you can't look at him like you he, look at him as your savior. He did not <laughs> come for these things. And that's yeah. how do you get that across? I get it. A lot of people are fooled because right. they think that these people on TV know the Bible, and they don't. No, they don't. They don't. Like Joel Stein, the man has no clue what's in the Bible. Yeah. He's, he had, and just Jesse Duplantis. That man doesn't know the Bible. Amen. My granddaughter knows more about the Bible than what he knows. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, yeah. But I'm, they know how to preach their false doctrines. Yeah. You know, I, I, got, I, I got so fed up with that word of faith junk, and I, I, God knew in my heart. You know, Jody and I were searching for a long time. And I just was sick and tired of it. And I said, this is not doing any, me any good. I'm, I did all this stuff. I do these things they tell you to do, and they don't work. This, it's, and these people are becoming richer and richer and richer, more than the mansions and all them 40, 40 jets and all this stuff on the, pl on the uh, runway and all this stuff. I got tired of living, living like I got tired of listening to people like that. And God knew my heart. I was searching. Lord, I, I'm tired of this stuff. At TBN, you watch that. That's no good because they got all these guys... It's like Fruit Loops in there, you know. They got, they don't know what they're talking. They all don't agree with them. Nothing. That's why the message of the cross is the most solidifying message there is. I cannot go outside of it because that's the one that answers for everything. It's the answer for false doctrine. Until I came to this message, I couldn't detect what false doctrine was. But but because I learned this message a few years back, it's opened my eyes. Before I've never saw things I never saw before, and it's just man, it's, it's liberating to me. And that's why I never get tired of it. <sighs> oh, man. <clears throat> that's why I'm so emphatic about it. Verse 7. And again, he limited a certain day, saying in David, Today, today, after so long a time, as is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, Harden not your hearts. Oh, my Lord, my friends. Don't harden your heart. Don't harden your heart when you hear his voice. I'm not talking about you can hear. You know, you can hear with your physical ears, but people don't hear with their spirit. Do you know that? You know, we got to hear with our spirit, man. What is the spirit saying to you? Oh, my goodness. Don't, he's telling us don't harden your hearts to the gospel. Too many people in the church are, are in the church, but they're not of the church. And they're hardened their hearts toward the gospel. They soften their hearts toward this false junk. But they harden their hearts to the true gospel. And he limited, he says, hey, again, he limited a certain day. This means that even though the call of God is unlimited, unlimited, the opportunity to accept that call is definitely limited. You know, you could die tomorrow. You know that. You can get in an accident. You, leave the, you can go home this afternoon and get in a car accident and get killed. That's your limited opportunities. And the more you reject the, the, the call of the Holy Spirit to repent and be saved, the, the, the more you reject it, it you, the, the, world, the, the, the opportunity becomes more narrow and narrow. It gets smaller and smaller because you reject it. You harden your heart. Harden it. You harden your heart to the true gospel. And so man is cut off by death whether, or any situation even while he's alive. God stands ready to save at any and all times. However, there are definitely times in which the Holy Spirit is moving directly while at other times he may not be doing so. You know, I was reminded and I was looking at my notes this morning and I was reminded what John 6 verse 44 and it's a familiar scripture and I was looking back to this and I just wrote this down a few moments ago before I came in here. 
It says, well, he says, no man can come to me unless the, the, come, except the Father which sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. See, the Holy Spirit, the Father uses the Holy Spirit to draw men to repentance. Without the conviction power, the, without the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, you can't, you can't come to Christ. You can't come to Christ. You can't. Yeah. You and I, even, even our being conviction is God's working in us. You yeah. know, God grants us, yeah. he grants us a repentance. Yeah. Um, we don't understand this because we think, okay, I, I, I'm feeling sorry for my sins, so I'm going to ask God to forgive me. I'm repenting, not realizing that God knew you yeah. would believe he gives you yeah. a, a heart of repentance. Yeah. You know, salvation yeah. from start to finish is God. Yeah. Yeah. None of it's you and uh -huh. me. None of it. Yeah. Not even our belief and our faith. Yeah. We God grants us repentance. Yeah. He he helps us to he increases our faith through the Holy yeah. Spirit. Yeah. Otherwise we would remain reprobates. We would. Yeah. You know, I had to repent of that false doctrine I followed for all them years, forty something years. I had to repent of that. That was a long wilderness experience I had. Long one, long one, my friends. And I'm just so, I've been free, praise God, of that mess. And every time, I just don't even like looking at it today. I can't even stand to hear it. I just, I don't even turn it on. I don't watch that stuff. I don't, I don't watch junk like that. I don't even like to look at it. I don't even look at it on YouTube. You know, I only do it because I have to share something on what I hear here and what I share with you all or share with the pastor. But other than that, I don't look at that stuff. I don't look at what I, I don't do what I used to do. My goodness. <laughs> oh, Lord. You know, you ought to thank the Lord daily for your saving your soul. Yeah. I do that. I, I thank the Lord every day. So, Lord, thank you for saving my soul. Praise God. I'm looking for the rapture. I'm ready. Praise God. I want to go now. I want to go now, Lord. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of the destruction and death and destruction. I want to, I want to, I want to be with you, Lord. That should be the cry of the true believer, of the true believer's heart, isn't it? Am I right? You want to be with him. Praise God. And I pray. And I said, Lord, oh, I just, oh, I, I, I just want to be closer to you, Lord, and, uh, and spend time with the Lord. I'm so glad you got me out of that false doctrine stuff, you know, and, 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 and gave me the truth. Amen. Because this is the message. This is the true message. This is the gospel. And, and, and like I said before, the Holy Spirit is giving an altar call today. He's giving an altar call for not only for the sinner, but for the saint. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying, Pastor? It's time for the saint to repent. If my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. That's not for the sin. That's called for my people, God's people. We're God's people. Go ahead, Pastor. So we need to be witnessing to people, inviting them to church. I'm going to say this. We, if every one of us would reach one person, we right. to church. Yeah. You know, and then, you know, because that's how the church grows. Right. But you're going to have to, you, you, one, of, one of the areas you need to preach the gospel is to these false churches. Yeah. You know, false yeah. Christians, they're just as lost as the, well, the yeah. atheists. It's called repent. Yeah. Amen. They're, they're, they're Amen. just as lost as an atheist. Yeah. Uh, get them out of these false churches out there that are preaching, the, you know, like we're going to talk about today, the smooth words. Yeah. You know, that's all they teach. Uh, all they teach is the lies yeah. and deceptions. Yeah. yeah. Don't give me those smooth words. I don't want them. I want the truth. Amen. Praise God. <sighs> Golly. This is so good. I got five minutes. Go ahead. Uh, somebody, Brother uh, Tony had his hand up. He's, he's coming. Uh, something the pastor had said about, you know, faith and belief and even repentance coming from God. Yeah. Isn't that a part of somewhat Calvinistic because it nullifies man's responsibility no. to you know, to accept the word? No. No. Okay. Because you have to understand that God, our responsibility is to believe, mm -hmm. have faith. That is not a work. Right. What God sees is he sees that we are going to respond 
positively to the uh -huh. gospel. Therefore, he gives us. Second Timothy 2.25 says, God grants repentance. Right. He, he, he gives it to us because he knows we're going to believe. See, otherwise, we're just going to have like a lot of people, and let me just share this. We've had people come in this church who will say, oh, I need Jesus. I'm sorry I've been living in sin, and I need Jesus. And we try to help them. We say, listen, repent, get back to church, learn, and after their crisis is over, they're gone. We don't see them again. Right. Right, yeah. Ken? Right. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, there's several I, of them. Yeah, I've been. I've and been, all their yeah. repentance was was a man's repentance. Yeah. I'm sorry because I'm going through a lot of problems. God help me out of my problems. Seems like once the trouble goes, goes they go. You know, Pastor, I think yeah. they get confused with remorse and repentance. Yeah. They, they get those two well, words it's, confused. It's a, it, what's the Bible say? That's, that's a, it's not godly repentance. Right. Judas had remorse, yeah. but he didn't repent. Yeah, there's a, human, yeah. there's a worldly repentance that leadeth to damnation, but right. the godly repentance means I am sincerely sorry. Right. I'm a sinner, and I need Jesus, and I want to follow him. Not just be saved. I want to follow him. Right. And yeah. God gives you that from start to finish as the justified, sanctified, eventually glorified. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for sharing that. That's good. I like that. So we're not to be remorseful. We're to be repent of, <laughs> repent of our sin and turn away from it, you know, and, and, and don't go back to it, you know. <sighs> that word limited in this, that word limited in this verse right here in verse uh, 7 doesn't I refer to God but, but to man. God is not limited and his call is not limited, but it's whosoever will, like I said in Revelation twenty two seventeen. Where that's it's whosoever will man is definitely limited and so in fact the holy spirit is saying here he's given an altar call and he's been doing that from the very beginning from the very beginning saying in david today after so long a time so paul's alluding back to he's alluding back to psalm 95 and david's day which was about some 500 years after the wilderness experience the holy spirit is still very, is, he's still saying today now is the time to accept the Lord because there might not be a tomorrow for some and in fact will not be a tomorrow for some. There might not be but some, but there might not be a tomorrow, but some there will not be a tomorrow. As it is, he says in continuing verse 7, as it is said today if you will hear his voice. that The Holy Spirit is only, he's the only one who can really give what we refer to as the great invitation. He invites us, amen, just like I said earlier. The gospel and its reception is never yesterday or tomorrow, but it's always today. Today. It's today, not tomorrow, not next week, not ne oh, some other time. It's today. Praise God. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. You know, I don't know if you thought about this, but I'm thinking all these, we give altar, you've heard altar calls and you've seen them, and people just, they think, well, I can, they just, and I, they don't, they know they need the cry, but they reject. They don't come. And my, they think they're saved because they belong to the church. And they don't need to come forward and accept Christ as their Savior. We have millions in the church like that today. Their association with a church or a prayer group or a denomination, they think that they're saved. Go ahead, Pastor. Okay. So God speaks to our heart through the word. And he shows us that we are doing something that's contrary to his word. That is our time to, to say, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, yeah. repent. God is showing us. So now God, with the Holy Spirit's doing the work, yeah. but if you refuse that, say, oh, I know that's what's in the Bible, but I'm not going to because I enjoy doing this in cult sin or whatever you want. Yeah. The fact is you're hardening your heart, uh -huh. and you are dis you're, you're really you're disobeying. Why? Because of unbelief. unbelief. There, that's unbelief right there. Unbelief. Yep. Unbelief. That's unbelief. We have. We know what happens to those who don't believe, don't we? We we, we they die. The people in the in Israel, ancient Israel, died in the wilderness. Two million people, approximately, died in the wilderness. You'll die. The same God that saw those people die will see people die today because of unbelief. Go there, ahead. And that's why Paul, who's writing Hebrews, is talking about this. He said that. God had a great church going through the wilderness, but most of them never made it. Never made it. So they, there are people in church this morning that aren't going to make it. You start, they start, you know that, you know, well, I talked about this last week. They start out well. 
Oh, they were singing the praise of Miriam the prophetess, leading them in worship, dancing the tambourines yeah. and all that. But God has led us to the, the midst of the Red Sea. When they started out well, but they all died. Miriam died. Yep. Aaron died. Yep. All these yeah. people, all because their, their, their faith was in the moment. Right, in the moment. But they didn't complete, they didn't, they didn't continue. Right. And God knew they wouldn't continue. That's exactly. the thing, Ken, we have to understand. God knew they would not continue. Therefore, Amen. he knew who would, and that's why he made them wander in the wilderness for yeah. 40 years. Continue in my word, and you shall also be my disciples. I'm going to stop there, praise God. And let's pray, and we'll pick this up next Sunday. Amen? Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this, this message you gave us, Father God. And I pray that we'll take heed to hear what the Spirit is saying to this hour, Lord. And we ask you to continue being with us, Holy Spirit, and uh, turn our worship service and the preached, preaching of the word, Lord. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us in this hour. In his precious name I do pray. Amen and amen.